Lord. Father, thank you. In your name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. While the uh, Scots are coming, I just want to remind us that we are a tremendously blessed church. We have, in the last few weeks, been introduced to two young couples that have given their life for service for Jesus. You know, often we hear missionaries that have been on the field for years and years, and it's just an extreme privilege for us to hear young couples that have been called by God to serve on a mission field. It, we haven't heard this before, but two times in one month, we are totally blessed. And both of these couples are going to a part of the world that is just totally confused. Um, in fact, a friend of mine calls this the part of the world chaos stand. And uh, because a lot of those countries that actually end with the stand, Croatia doesn't, Serbia doesn't, Bosnia doesn't, Herzegovina doesn't, Ukraine and Poland, Poland and Romania, but it's a confused part of the world, but it's a part of the world where people are searching for answers. People that have been suppressed by uh, communism and had the darkness of the world for years and years and years now open to the gospel and coffee houses and working with human trafficking and I don't know what the Scots are going to be doing, but it's not the, the, the traditional missions that we're used to hearing about. And we will support you and pray for you. You can be guaranteed. And after the, after the service, make sure that you um, make your uh, wallets open and uh, offer them a love offering too as they are, are drumming up support for their mission. God bless you. I just wanted to share a little bit about um, who we are. I, I love to talk about Croatia so much. Sometimes I realize we skip over who we are. <laughs> so um, I'm really excited to actually be here with my family because I actually came to the States um, almost two weeks earlier than they could come. And the reason that is is because our son Jacob, who's eight and a half years old, is in a Croatian public school. He just finished second grade. And when you make a choice like that on the mission field, you have to make a commitment and some sacrifices need to be made in order to keep your child in school as long as they can um, because he's learning everything that a second grader would learn first in another language. So um, we have to work hard at supplementing his English at home. So I'm so happy to be here with them. And even this morning, we traveled seven, eight hours in the car, and we were thinking, should we leave our children with our brother-in-law and his sister-in-law who were staying with in Sugarland? And, we, and I just was saying, no, let's just go as a family. It just feels so good to be here together as a family. Um, so our, we have um, Jacob, who's eight and a half, and Emma is two and a half. And like Jimmy said, I was, maybe was like here, maybe not, yeah, yeah. Uh, I was very pregnant. Actually, they almost didn't let me come back on the airplane coming home from Turkey um, because they thought I was past the point of being able to fly, but I wasn't. Anyway, um, Dave and I were just commissioned as global missionaries in February. Um, before that, we have, well, we have been serving in Croatia for three and a half years, and before that, we served in France for a year. Um, so we were, we just feel, we love Croatia, we love the people of Croatia. It is really, truly home to us. So um, we're excited that as global missionaries, we have the opportunity to go back and serve in a place that just has captured our hearts. And really, we feel that we, that God is just beginning to do so many amazing things, and we're excited to share those with you today. I wanted to share, now I'm going to share a little bit about Croatia for those who don't know where it is and which part of the world. Some key words that might help you understand what Croatia is, is southeastern Europe, um, former Yugoslavia, and this word Balkan. So the word Balkan is interesting to understand because all of the neighboring countries um, around, around Croatia, they resonate with what it means to be Balkan. This is all the Balkan Peninsula here. And it's interesting how they can have their own traditions, their own culture and language, but they still resonate with what it means to be Balkan. I've heard this like, oh, she's such a Balkan female. And that means like someone who's strong-willed and opinionated and speaks her mind. And, oh, that's the Balkan way of doing things, you know. And uh, that sometimes that means, 
you know, cutting corners or doing things the, the cheapest way instead of, you know, the most expensive way and those types of things. So that is like our culture. It's Balkan. Um, Central Europe, some, some of our country resonates with Central Europe. Where we live in Zagreb, the capital, they would say, I'm not really Balkan. I feel more Central European. So what's interesting about Croatia is that there are lots of different realities in this country. I once heard a Croatian woman say that it's where the east meets, or the west eats the meat. Let me start that over. <laughs> meats. I want some meat for lunch. I think meat's on my mind. It's where, it's where the west meets the east. And what that means is that you can be in parts of Croatia and feel like you're in Western Europe, or you can be in parts of Croatia and you feel like you're in a little Albanian village. So there's lots of different realities about Croatia. The other thing I wanted to share quickly, you don't have to go to the next one yet, is that um, there was a war that happened from 1991 to 1995. Uh, so going back to former Yugoslavia, it's important to understand that Croatia was part of the one of the six socialist republics of former Yugoslavia. So up here you can see it's the country in yellow. It's across the water from Italy. That's the Adriatic Sea. So basically, when the Berlin Wall fell, um, communism began to fall in a lot of Eastern Europe and in Southeastern Europe. And this happened in Yugoslavia. So the first country to break apart and claim independence was Slovenia, up here, the country in blue. And then the second country was Croatia. But when Croatia did that, they had boundary line um, tension between the neighboring country, Serbia, which is this, this country over here in pink. And then what happened was a war ensued for four years over certain areas. You had Serbs and Croats living together peacefully before that, but when Croatia began to, to break apart, or to break away from Yugoslavia and claim their independence, a lot of racial tensions began to flare up. The, the one country began to, to instill fear in the other country, and you better watch out, they're going to get you. And there was just all of this media that was causing fear, and they began to rise up, be very nationalistic, and they began to fight. And so in eastern Croatia is where there is a worn torn city called Vukovar. I bring this up because in the month of May, we were praying as a team for peace and reconciliation. Um, and I'm not saying it's the only time we've been praying for it, but we had a team from Point Loma come. We had our three volunteers from Treveca come for the summer. And we all said, let's, let's just focus this month on praying. And how can the church be a part of peace and reconciliation in this area? Because there really still are so much racial tensions that exist between these two groups. So we brought the groups over to Eastern Croatia for the first time, met an amazing man doing ministry there. He's doing, again, something unconventional. He's, he's, it's called Valley of the Blessings, where he's trying to find a way to bring Serbs and Croats together. So he has an art night. And he's been wanting to open a coffee shop, and, but really has had no support. And so who knows? Who knows how God is going to connect the Nazarenes to what this man is doing in Vukovar? And I bring that up because I, I just want to invite you in to be praying for peace and reconciliation in Croatia. Um, so the next question becomes, why, why do people like us move to a foreign land, and why should any of us um, be engaged in missions? Which, actually, the next slide, I wanted to show pictures of Zagreb. If you could go ahead there. I wanted to show you, these are some realities that I see every day in Zagreb. And you're going to see a video. Well, you'll see more images of people and some areas that surround us. Up in the top left corner, this is, um, she is called a bakitsa. And she is, a, she's a, a Balkan female. She just works and works hard. She sells her goods at the market. That's my favorite place to be, is in the market, open air market in Zagreb. And then to the right, you have what's called the coffee culture. This is a perfect example. When the weather is even a, a little bit nice, everybody is outside in the cafes. And they do this because it's called their neutral place. They meet there. They have business meetings. A lot of the youth and young adults live with their parents till well in their 30s. They have small apartments. So they don't want to invite people into their home for dinners. They go out and they have social meetings at cafes. So you have all sorts of interactions that happen at a cafe. At a cafe and it's just really such a beautiful part of the city. And we love coffee, so it works for us. Um, and then this picture down here is taken from the upper town, and that's a picture of Zagreb. So I wanted to talk quickly about missions with you, if I could, because I, you know, as I was coming here and preparing, and as we were preparing, I was thinking, what can I share with them? Maybe, I don't know. I know you've had lots of missionaries, and they all share different things. Um, so I wanted to start by talking about how, uh, how I think it's so amazing that we just, we have a book right here, and it's a missionary book. And that's a kind of, I wanted to talk a little bit about that first. Um, if you think of the a verse in the Bible that stands out and screams missions, most people say the Great Commission. 
And so these, these verses are, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, I go, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. And coincidentally, if you could go to the next one, that would be great. Coincidentally, and the one after, that this is also the Nazarene statement of mission, to make Christ-like disciples in the nations. But what we see in the Bible is actually over 200 verses in the Old Testament plus the New Testament that talks about God's heart for the nations. So you see, we don't, we don't just have a book that has a one or a couple of verses that talks about missions and what it means to make disciples in the nations. We have, it's a missionary book. It's an intensely missionary book. We serve a missionary God. And so I wanted to talk about how grateful we are to serve and be a part of a church that has a passion for missions. And if you could go to the next one, um, this and the one after that. Uh, actually, you know, if you could go back, I wanted to share those two verses right there. Um, the first one specifically, Genesis 12. I think this is really important. This is the range of, of what we see in the Bible of, as far as missions. And I love this first one. I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. The reason this is important is because I, I, I once, uh, we, the Treveca, um uh, head of the, the, the theology department came, and he did a class on Genesis and he was talking about this specific passage, and he said, isn't it amazing that we serve a God that doesn't just bless us? We, we weren't just created to receive blessing. We were, we were created to be a blessing to others. And I think this is exactly what missions is like for us. Every day we wake up in our context. How can we be a blessing to those around us? And so I wanted to talk about how when we look at that this is a missionary book and we look at how many, how many times we hear of God's heart for the, for the nations, how does this flow into me as a missionary and us in Croatia? Well, it means two things. It means God has a heart for Croatia, okay? And God, and God, and Croatia is not foreign to God. And that's really important to understand because we didn't bring God's work to Croatia. God is there working and he uses us. And that's what I want to talk about in the passage we're going to talk about is how God uses us and how much growth God gives when we allow ourselves to be used by him. Um, but I wanted to talk, the next slide, it just, I wanted to mention this because I love this beautiful concept that the Church of the Nazarene has called the World Evangelism Fund. It's, the concept is this, that we can do more working together than could ever be done working alone. That every single church, no matter what size they are, no matter how many people they have, they all have an opportunity to participate in God's mission, God's heart for the nations. And over here are some mission facts that I found that are either directly or indirectly rated, related to WEF, and they're pretty amazing. So I just want to say, even as we stand up here, I love that we're a part of a church that has a heart for the nations. Um, so what I wanted to share with you today, I, I wanted to dissect a passage, um, and it's written by Paul. And it's a letter written to the church in Corinth. And this is the passage we're just going to di dissect. And I was just thinking, I could not get this passage out of my head. I put it in a newsletter once, and I thought, I think there's more here. And I really want to look at this, and I want to show you how... What are the words that Paul writes to this church in Corinth? How does that affect how I am as a missionary and our ministry? And really, it, it, how does that flow into what it looks like to be a missionary there in that context? So number one, I want to read it together if we can. Okay, so if you could go to the next slide, I'm going to go ahead and read that. What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you came to believe, as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. The one who plants and the one who waters have a common purpose, and each will receive wages according to the labor of each. For we are God's servants working together. You are God's field, God's building. According to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation and someone else is building on it. Each builder must choose with care how to build on it. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one that has been laid. That foundation is Jesus Christ. And I just, I love those passages. I think they're just, they're beautiful and there's so much there. So I wanted to talk about the first point. I, oh, well, before that, I wanted to, before we even understand what these passages mean, why was this letter written? Uh, who wrote it? 
We know Paul wrote it. We know he's writing a letter to the church in Corinth. I think it's important to understand that the way the church saw Paul were in these three words. They either saw him as a spiritual leader of some kind, a pastor, a teacher. And it's important for me to point that out because people see us in our context as missionaries. They see us as spiritual leaders and as pastors and as teachers. And so if you could go to the next one. We know that Paul visited this church on three different occasions. One, the church was founded during the painful visit and after some Corinthians had been sent. And then it's important to understand why was this written. Well, Paul, first of all, was replying to a letter that he had received from the Corinthian church. He was also responding about things he had heard independently of that letter. He heard things like there were irregularities in their conduct and they had a quarrelsome spirit. And Paul was troubled about the divisions of the church and he wanted to give doctrinal teaching. So before we can understand what these words are saying, I think it's important to understand why this letter was written. If we get the, so what I did was I said, I'm going to pull some missiological principles out of these verses, and I want to kind of talk about those a little bit. Number one, what I hear when I read this is that we are not God. I know that seems a little bit crazy to say, but we really aren't, nor are we important as God. And I, what I see on the mission field sometimes is that missionaries, they make themselves really important. And what Dave and I have realized is that when we make ourselves small, God becomes so much bigger than that. And I know that sounds a little bit weird to say, but I was reading a commentary on this passage, and it said, Paul insists on the primacy of God and the insignificance of God's ministers. I know that seems a little bit upside down of maybe even church culture, but that is so, I I really resonated with that. I said, as a missionary, I feel insignificant sometimes. I've had to make myself small as a baby to learn the language, to rely on other people to help me. And do you know what God has done? When I've done that, God has made that relationship blossom. God has created a a codependency on each other. We learn to rely on each other. The most amazing thing happens when we are willing to make ourselves small and say, God be glorified. And so the next thing is, in verse 9, three times God comes first. First, God's servants, God's building, God's field. He talks about in verse 7 that we are not as important as God's work. And this is the part I really like. So Paul is talking about himself and Apollos. And he says, we are servants. And the Greek word he uses here is like a table waiter. So what he's saying is it's really hard to put someone on a pedestal when you're comparing them to a table waiter. But he's saying we are instruments of God's work. I love that. I love that he just says, you know what? I just want to be used by God. And he wants to remind this church that it's not about them. He doesn't want that church to serve them. He wants that church to serve God. And this is really important for us as missionaries. We don't want to create a Dave and Betsy church that if we left, that that church would fall apart because they've just been centered around us. We want them to fall in love with what it means to be the Church of the Nazarene, the beautiful heart that we have to serve and to compassionately serve in our communities and be Christ. This is the kind of stuff we want them to fall in love with. Um, and number, number, and the last one is in verse 10, he said, it's only by God's grace that he could even do anything. He said, sure, I laid a foundation and people are building on it, but it's by God's grace that I could do that. And I just love that Paul keeps pointing back to God over and over again. And so and the next point that we, I, that we see, this mis, kind of missiological perspective here, is that God gives the growth. And you're going to see shortly after I go over the next point, we're going to see a video. And Really, none of that video is about us. We sh- we used God used us in so many different ways, and He used the thirteen volunteers that we've had that have served with us in amazing ways. But God has given the growth. He says Paul water Paul planted, Apollos watered, but God gives the growth. The real work is done by God. It is only God that makes it grow. In verse six, what I find is interesting is that He says though that the planter and the waterer they have a common purpose. They're all working together for the kingdom of God but each will be awarded for their own labor. I can't tell you how many times we've had conversations with volunteers, and this is important because you have a trip coming up, right, about planting seeds. A lot of times we have volunteers come, and they because they don't see the growth of what they've done, they just kind of feel useless or helpless or just, oh, this is just so sad. I'm leaving. I can't see anything grow. And what's so amazing is God's saying, be the planter. Be the planter and be the water, and it's okay. I will give growth. And we can walk away from those situations totally having faith that God is going to bring growth, that we have been faithful in using, in allowing him to use us the way he's wanted to use us. Um, the next point, and this is extremely important, a foundation. How important is a foundation in a building? And Paul says 
that our foundation needs to be in Christ. What I think is interesting in verse 10 is he says, when we choose our own foundation, the building is not stable. Paul says, be careful. And I've also seen that in ministry where we are too. People build things or start something without the right foundation. And so this, he says there's only one possible foundation and it's Christ. So this next slide, it, it shows you the title of the nonprofit that we created. It's called Diallo Lubavi. The reason we created this is we wanted to have a way that we can compassionately serve in our communities and to be Christ. We thought, okay, we walked into a context where there is no established church of the Nazarene, not in Croatia, not in Bosnia, not in Serbia. And all of those countries, coincidentally, they all speak the same language. There's no, there's no church of the Nazarene in any of these countries. So we thought, okay, if we don't have a building, how will they even understand who we are or what we're about? And it really didn't take long. They said they're going to see by our actions. And it's the same here in your community. How you compassionately serve and care for others in your community is so important. So we thought we want a way to be the G Jesus hands and feet in our community. We asked these questions. What is breaking the heart of God in this community that we live? And how can we compassionately serve? How does God want us to be a blessing to others? And what part can we play in the redemptive work and life-giving work that God wants to do in this community through Jesus Christ. You're going to see a video, and we're going to share a couple of stories because these are people very dear to our hearts. They'll just be faces to you. So we kind of wanted to share a couple of stories after the video. Abounds in deepest waters. You saw. 
We have the uh, unique opportunity to minister in some strange ways. Um, one of them that, that we didn't really talk about too much is this charity shop. Um, and this came about. Yeah, I'm kind of facing the wrong way. This came about um, with our, our friends and, and partners, the Tushkans, Janet and Tomislav. And we spent so much time together praying about how God wanted to use us, use our friendship use our resources, uh, use our time. And we were praying and praying and praying, and, and these ideas kept popping up, and, and then this little space came, became available. And we went and looked at it, and it was this, like, closet that looked, like, full of garbage. You know, there was this broken wall in there, and, and you know, it was, it was terrible. But God said, I think you should rent this. So he did. And we had these ideas of maybe a cafe or something like that. And then God said, no, not, not quite. We want you to ha I want you to have a charity shop in there, a thrift store. And this is really strange. First, because, you know, I don't know of any other charity shop like this in the country. Um, I know they're more common here, but they, they don't have them there. So this, this charity shop started. And uh, on, on one of the first weeks... Um, we, we had our doors open, and, and everyone was curious and, and skeptical. And people would come in and, and, you know, sometimes be a little bit angry. They, they didn't trust what we were doing. Um, and one time I, I saw this. It was maybe the first week. And I saw this, this old guy. looked like a homeless guy. He had his cart behind him. He's pulling. He had empty bottles and things that he had collected, and he was just disheveled and had these, you know, dirty, big, baggy clothes on, real small guy. And he walked by. And then I saw him walk back the other way. And then I saw him walk again. And the third time he stopped at the door and, and, and he came in and he basically said, like, what, what is this place? And we said, well, you know, this is a place where if you need something, you can have it. And if you want to leave something, please leave it. Um, but it, it's here for the community. It's here for you, whatever you need. He said, I can take anything I want. He said, if you need something, take it. You know, here's some men's clothes. And, and so he walked over and he looked at each piece of clothing. And, um, and then he, he stopped at this jacket and he took this jacket down. And, and uh, so he, he, he put the jacket aside and then he took his own jacket off. And, and, uh, and, and he, 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 he put his, uh, you know, take this. He put his own jacket on, on the back of a chair, and, and then he, he, he put this jacket on his, his body. And he's this little guy's hunched over, his hair's all messy. And, and uh, he put this jacket on, and he walked over to the mirror that we had standing there. And, and uh, he stood in front of the mirror, and he you know, straightened the jacket a little bit. And he stood up really straight, pushed his hair over to the side, 
puffed out his chest and smiled. And it was this physical transformation. It was this, right before my eyes, this man turned into this homeless, kind of grouchy looking guy into Hakia. His name is Hakia. And it was, again, like Betsy said so many times, this is not something that we've done. This is something that God said, do it. And we said, okay. And we had this opportunity to see this man, this homeless guy walk by, turn into a person. Now, I guess I'm saying that a little bit funny, but to so many people in the neighborhood, he was just a homeless guy. He's not. He's Hakia. He is not a homeless guy. He lives in the, the next building over. And almost, a, almost to the day, maybe a, a few weeks before he showed up at, at this little shop, his wife had died of cancer. Um, his son, who lives with him, is, I think, 40 or 50, is an alcoholic and steals all of his uh, social checks that come in. And the only money he has to eat is, are, are, is from what he, how he collects bottles. And Hakia has become part of the family. He comes every day, at least once a day. And if we're open, he's there five times a day. And we have coffee for him and cookies. And, and it's amazing because he just doesn't come and take stuff. He comes and brings stuff. He has nothing. Hakia has nothing. But he'll, when he can, he'll bring a bottle of juice to share with everybody. Or he'll bring some of his, his grandkids' clothes that they don't need anymore. Um, and he's just part of the family. And it was this, this, I mean, it's just faithfulness. And I don't want to sound like we're something special. It was God saying, do it. And we were just like, really? Okay, let's do it. And we get to see God moving and, and changing that community. I wanted to, we, we were invited to share about our charity shop ministry at our field conference in Turkey this last fall, or in, in Hungary, actually, this year. And they said, and the questions were, why, like, missiologically, why do a charity shop ministry? And I was standing there, and I was thinking, I can't really tell you that God told us to do a charity shop ministry, but I can tell you God told us to respond to the needs that we were seeing in front of us. And out of that came a charity shop. We met people who were so poor they couldn't provide for their families we we met i met a woman who had six children all of them were sleeping in the room with her husband and her in-laws were in the second bedroom in a two-bedroom apartment flat i mean we kept meeting people who were just struggling in so many ways and and you know broke student broken broke students and and god just said you know because we we started joining our friends at Tushkans doing their yard sales and they they started doing yard sale when nobody was doing yard sales in Croatia and they would raise all the proceeds for families in need and so out of that concept we said well why not do a charity shop people will give stuff to this charity shop if we just put up a sign that says bring things you don't want we provide it to the community you can leave a financial donation if you want and that's what we did and then God said there's one rule give grace so like when someone comes in who needs something we give it to them and what was, like Dave said, what was interesting is that barely anyone has taken advantage of that. What they do now is they give back. So it's just been amazing to watch God totally transform these lives. And in some ways, this community, if I could just share about Zdenka, and then you're going to share about Yvonne. Zdenka is another woman in the community, a retired midwife. She has cancer. She cares for her blind husband, an amazing woman. She started coming into Kana. She realized, oh, I know this man. I didn't know his name was Hakia, but I know him. He lives in my building. And she realized he wasn't taking his blood pressure medicine. And so every Tuesdays and Thursdays in Kana, our charity shop, she checks Hakia's blood pressure. And she makes sure he's taking his blood pressure medicine. So right before our eyes, we're watching God work and give growth in ways we never would have expected or imagined. And what's really interesting is it's not, now it's not just Hakia. I mean, the last time I talked to Tomislav, he said 15 people came to have their blood pressure checked. So this thing, yeah, this thing is happening around us, and we're just like kind of sitting back saying, wow, this is so cool. Um, and before, I want to share the, my, 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 the story about Ivan kind of at the end. Uh, he's a special kid to me. Um, but before we do that, I would just want to say um, we're so grateful that you guys have had us. Um, and we have the privilege of going, kind of traveling around and sharing stories and hearing stories uh, uh, from the different churches we get to go to, and we just want to thank you for your partnership and uh, allowing us to be here with you. Um, there are needs that we have. Um, we desperately would love partnership. 
as far as volunteers to come, long-term volunteers, families. Um, so if you hear of anyone or are, are prayerful about that, um, that's kind of been on our hearts from the beginning. I mean, we, in a way, not, we're not doing it on our own. We have these short-term volunteers come, which is great. But we're partner people. We like to do stuff as a team and together. And I think there are strength in, in things like that. So there are needs like that. Uh, we have, which you saw in the video, a new space. It's called the Hub, the community center that we have. I mean, really, we just got the, the keys almost before we came here. And we had a team come from Point Loma, and they helped clean it up and organize. It's, it's, it's storage for our charity shop, but it's also going to be a community center where the community can use it and do classes, or we can do Bible studies, a church, English club, anything, you know, knitting club, um, just a place for that's open to the to people. Which, again, I want to say, it was not not by our talents that we found this space. Literally, God gave us this space. And the reason we're having a community center is because God kept showing us needs of the people that we are meeting in our charity shop. Like, we would meet students who were really had never done any financial management. They had zero financial management skills. And, and tons of debt. And so somebody said, well, why don't we hold a financial class um, ha- led by this Croatian Christian man in the area? Perfect. And then we had volunteers that said, wait, I would love to teach the community how to sew. Okay, let's have a, ki- let's have a sewing class. And out of these needs of people that were coming into the charity shop, God is now providing a way for us to do more community center type of activities. Yeah. Um, our, you know, there's so many things. Um, our partners, we would love your prayer for our, for our growth and our partnerships with the Tushkans, our great friends, um, just to continue to bring us together. And there's lots of prayer prayer needs. And our car completely died literally the day that I left. It's done. And so <laughs> we have to somehow, I, I know God's got plenty of money and the car will be there, but we're going to need one when we get back. There, this charity shop and all this stuff. All these different ministries take a lot of work and a lot of driving and things like that. And so having no car at this point, we're just saying, all right, God, I know you're going to work it out. So um, so there's a, there's a lot of needs in those ways. But really, partnership is it. We want partners. We want we felt supported by you guys and encouraged, and we want that to continue. And we want to be here for you also. We want you to know that you have also been on our hearts and, and minds and uh You'll be in our prayers, and really this, this connection here means a lot to us um, that you guys are willing to welcome us like this. Um, so please stay connected with us. We have a website and, and things like that, and ask us questions, emails. Like, we're open books, so please, uh, we'd love to stay connected in these different ways. Um, so if, And come. You know, if you want to come, come. Send us an email. Say, hey, we want to come to Croatia and see what's happening. Please. If you don't want to come, but you know someone who does, help them come, really. I mean, not everyone is called to, to, to go to these places or, or help. or. But, you know, you can encourage those who are called to, to, to come in those ways. So, partner, please, we want to do this stuff together. We certainly can't do it alone. Um, so before I pray, I did want to talk a little bit about Ivan. Because um, so much of what Betsy has been talking about um, is this idea that we are not God. It's not about us. It's not about something that we do. It's about what God is doing, and we get to kind of participate in it. Um, it's about being faithful um, with each step, with each day, with each minute, about saying, God, how can you use me? Um, and, and like she was talking about, God gives the growth. It's not something that we, we can't make a flower grow. That's something that God does, and we just need to be faithful with these planting or watering or scraping in the dirt, whatever it is, as long as our foundation is in God and in Christ, and we know that God was there before us and God will be there after us. But God just calls us to be faithful. And this kid is a unique uh, um, story about, I guess, God asking me to be faithful. Um, He came to our house probably about two years ago. Uh, I had invited a, a group of other kids that I know. Uh, Ivan is a, a Roma kid. He's a gypsy kid who lives in, an, he lived in an abandoned building behind our apartment. And a number of families uh, rotate in and out of that building. And so I knew some of the people back there and had them over to our garden for some cookies and juice. And Ivan just happened to kind of join and come over, and, and he had some juice and cookies too. And 
This family that I knew ended up moving away, but Ivan kept coming back. And at first it was like crazy. He would come and he, he can't ring the doorbell once. He rings it 800 times until I show up at the door and say, Ivan, one time, one time. I can hear it, Ivan, one time, please. And at first he came and said, you know, can I have money? Can I have food? Can I have JJ's toys? He can see him in the back. I want that. And we say, no, Ivan, you know, no money, no food, no toys. You know, just play with JJ. We didn't want him to come for stuff. Uh, we wanted him to know he was welcome, but he, we're not going to give him stuff. Um, so he became buddies with JJ. I mean, they would play together every day. Ivan, oh, every morning, bring, 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 bring. Ivan, come on. And, and then he'd say, you know, can JJ come to play? Or, you know, can I come in the backyard? Or he, he had a million different bikes. They were all mostly garbage, but he wanted me to fix them. That's one of my kind of hobbies. I like to fix bikes. So I'd bring out my tools, and, I mean, he'd bring this garbage bike, and he'd be like, you know, can you fix it? No, but I'll, you know, fool around with it with you for a little bit and play with wrenches. So over this, the course of these years, Ivan, he really did come just about every day. And if he didn't come, it was almost like, where's Ivan? Because he came every day. Uh, sometimes he'd come early, bring, bring, you know, and Betsy's like, you know, Dave, you have to tell him seven is too early to be ringing our doorbell 800 times. Um, but just over time, he just, he just kind of gets to you. He's, he's, he's in your heart and, and, I, you know, we were prayerful about Ivan because, you know, these kind of situations are tricky because we don't want him to come to us for stuff. We want him to come to us, you know, for us or what, you know. So God was really just saying, love on this kid, love on this kid, love on this kid, love on this kid. And 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 in this country, in mo a lot of Europe, the gypsies are looked at like garbage, basically. Um, they are... At best, they're outcasts in society. They live in, most of the time, they live in garbage houses that they've built out of trash they found or, you know, scraps they've put together. Um, and no one will give a gypsy a job, so they don't have any source of income. They have nothing. They really have nothing. Um, so really, God was just saying, love on this kid. And, and I know he probably doesn't get that very much. Um, so over those two years, we just spent so much time with Yvonne and, uh, he kind of just became part of the family. I mean, one, one morning he came to the door, and he just looked terrible. And it was early, and I think Betsy was like, why is he here so early? It was early. And he just said, he just, he, and he never did, this was after a while, he never did this anymore. He just said, Mike, my stomach hurts. And he looked really bad, and I said, you know, have you eaten anything? And he said, no. I said, did you eat anything yesterday? And he said, no. Um, so he came in, and we, I made him some eggs, and he had some cereal, and we just kind of sat, and had breakfast together and talked, and he's just a special kid. He's, he's a special kid. The life that he has is unimaginable to me, how difficult it is. I've been to where he was living. It is like walls falling down, no electricity, no water, no nothing. Just He's living in garbage. There's garbage everywhere. And that's his life. That's his foreseeable future. His future is to live in garbage, really. And uh, God just was saying, just love on this kid. And one day, about oh, maybe it's three months ago or so, they were gone. They had left. I don't know where they went. Um, I don't know what happened to Ivan. Um, interestingly enough, uh, just a few days ago, two days ago, three days ago, we got an email from or Facebook or something from one of our volunteers who's staying in our house, and she said, this kid showed up at the door, and he's asking for a ball, um, and I'm not sure what to do. And I can only imagine that it's Yvonne, that Yvonne's back. Um, but this is one of these areas that, you know, Betsy was talking about, that it's our job to plant and water and then just, you know, let God do the work. But sometimes that's so hard. It's hard to sit back and have faith that God will do these things. And, you know, when we were, I was making this video and thinking about, stories to tell. I was I had other stories in mind and then just Yvonne just came, you know, just jumped out. This is where God is challenging me to be faithful because I can't make it better for Yvonne. And I can only love him when God says now is the time to do this and and he'll be gone. You know, he's he left. There's nothing I can do. And it's hard even now. I know he's there and I can't be there. 
I'm not in Croatia right now. I'm here. And I have to be faithful that God is growing something in Ivan, that God is doing the work that has only been my job to be faithful when God wants me to be, to do these things, these take these steps when God is putting them in front of me and saying, take this step, Dave. And then I just have to let it go. And Yvonne is one of these things that I have to let go and continue to pray and love Yvonne from afar and trust that God is doing something. And that kind of goes back to all of these ministries and even the stuff that you guys are involved in. You know, we can get carried away in thinking we can do this, we can do this, even, you know, we can do this as a team and we're going to see this, this, and this. And sometimes we don't. What we need to do is be faithful. And sometimes that is the hardest thing to do. And for me, uh, this is a stretching time for me to let God, to, you know, sounds silly, but to give Ivan to God. I know God, are, you know, it's already God's, but to give that away. Um, so if we could, if we could pray uh, real quick before uh, we go, that would be nice. Let's pray. God, uh, we love you so much. We know that you are at work in the world. Um, we know that you uh, were at work in Croatia before we got there and that you will be at work after we leave. We know that you're at work here. God, you are doing something. You are changing people's hearts. And God, you use us. And sometimes it's incredibly humbling to know that you want us to be your hands and your feet. You want us to empty ourselves so that we can be used by you. And God, I'm humbled that you use me. And I pray for people like Yvonne. Um, I pray that you bring love and peace and joy into the hearts of people who don't normally have it. I pray that you bring love and joy and peace to Ivan. Um, I think everybody here has an Ivan in their life. And God, I, I pray for those people too. You're a faithful God. We have your word that shows your faithfulness. And we can look back and see her faithfulness over and over and over again. And that gives me hope to be faithful for the future. And God, I just ask that you use everyone in this room to be your hands and your feet, to realize that it's not about us, but it's all about you. God, I thank you so much for the love that you've given me and everyone in this room. And God, as we leave this place, let us be closer to you let us be less of ourselves and more of you. Let us go into our communities and our families and our friendships and our workplaces and be your love to those people. God, transform us, transform this place, transform Croatia. Uh, we love you so much. In your son's name, amen. and share your time with us while you're here in the uh, in the states can can I ask just a couple of questions just to kind of help people um, if you just got commissioned in February how is it that you've been overseas for four and a half years I'm not going to take a lot of time I promise but there's a couple of questions there that I think will help us as a people we'll be brief we'll be brief we started out as volunteers in France we lived in France for one year and that was on a strictly volunteer basis, like any short-term group or something like that. You know, we met the, the missionaries who were retiring. They said, please come to France. We'd love for your family to join in this ministry that's happening there. So we, we did that. And as that time came to a close, um, we had the opportunity to go to Croatia. And, and how it works is, is when you um, kind of go to the, the uh, like a, a different, I don't know, oh, this way, sorry. Oh, yeah, my back was to everybody, sorry. <laughs> so kind of the uh, next, a different kind of missionary, uh, we, uh, the next one is like an intern missionary. So it's like a trial period for everybody to see if we're a good fit um, and to see if the country and, and the Church of the Nazarene is a good fit for us. And so we were on that status up until February, which is when we became commissioned, when we say this is a good fit for us and they say it's a good fit for us. Um, if that, maybe that's confusing, sorry. 
That's a long-term commitment. Very, yes, that, that answers the question that I thought might have uh, arise in people's mind. Uh, we do have a lot of people here that have, uh, five years ago weren't Nazarene. And uh, so for them, I say thanks for helping us to understand what the Church of the Nazarene is, uh, for helping us understand who the Church of the Nazarene serves and, uh, and the God that we're obedient to. And uh, just from my heart to you, I say thanks for being obedient to what God has asked you to, to do. Thank you very much for coming and sharing and um, giving of your time and, and your life uh, to the kingdom of God. Thank you. And if you're new to Cornerstone, uh, you probably realize that uh, we might be a little bit different at church. You didn't see a pay, uh, an offering plate go by you in front of you this morning uh, because uh, we're not all about money. It's all about Jesus here. There are offering boxes here and in the foyer, and uh, it's not all about money here. It's all about Jesus. And uh, you guys probably didn't even see the backside of the rock as you came in. It said Cornerstone on the way out. It says it's all about Jesus. And really, we try to emphasize that. And we appreciate you showing us uh, the same thing in Croatia. It's not about Dave and Betsy. It's about Jesus. Thank you. But to do this, they also need funds to do that. And, uh, and I don't ask you to give generously very often. If you've only been here one month, you've heard me do it twice in a month. But if you've been here five years, you've only heard me do it twice in five years. But this is a young couple who have heard the voice of God in their heart and in their lives. They've been challenged. They've been presented an opportunity to serve and give like you and I cannot do. And they said, yes, L let's support that. Let's help them in doing what God has asked them to do. And then I'll just say this. There's plenty of food for everybody. And I did bring some meat. There's ham back there. There's pineapples and cherries and brown sugar, just the way I like it. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if y'all like it or not, but it doesn't really matter. I like it. And so that's the way I made it. Uh, we do want you to join us. Uh, we're just going to, it's going to be a non-program thing. It's come and eat. Enjoy yourself. Eat until you're satisfied. And uh, fellowship as long as you'd like and then go. The teens are going to be leaving as soon as that lunch is over. I said I wasn't going to be long. That's long. The teens are going to be leaving right after that uh, to go on our trip this summer. And they're just chomping at the bits back there like this. I'm sorry you guys had to talk to them because they're probably unattentive this morning. But uh, we're going to be leaving right after that. We would covet your prayers this week. We'll be coming back in time just for church next Sunday morning. So we will not be in our homes between now and next Sunday morning, but we're not going to miss a Sunday. We'll be back here next Sunday morning to come in uh, for church. So pray for us while we're gone. It'll be a, a deep study time in the evenings, and we'll be able to enjoy and see a lot of, of uh, God's creation around us as we enjoy the adventure of it, but the deep study part. Pray that God will grab a hold of the hearts of our teenagers. Because just like Dave and Betsy Scott answered the call of God in their life, our teenagers are facing a life that they should stop and listen and consider what God has for them. And these are the kind of, kinds of trips that God solidifies that call in. So pray for us as we go. Uh, you can put Scott, you can put missionary, you can put, if you just drop it in there, we'll, we'll put that into. Uh, do that for, is, do they need, they don't need to do it. They, Cornerstone, but in the memo line. Yeah, make the check out to Cornerstone, but just in the memo line. Thanks for bringing that up. I should have said that. But just in the memo line, something about Scots or missionary or something, or Croatia or whatever. And in just a second, but I'm just going to have the teens and the sponsors stand just so you can see who you need to be praying for that are going on the trip. Some of them are working on Children's Church. I think they're 16. And I'm standing, so y'all pray. Please pray. <laughs> all right, let's all stand. <laughs> yeah. Sean, Sean Weems, I don't see her in here. She's probably working. So, yeah, please pray for him. And uh, I don't know of a better fitting way to end the service than to sing How Great Thou Art. So let's just worship together. <laughs>